you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to uh, be speaking to you all at such an early time in the morning. Uh, here in the UK, it's 7 a.m., but I believe it's uh, 9 a.m. over there. So uh, when Iggy mentioned about the, the wine, um, a few years ago, I came to Cape Town and spent three months there on a sabbatical um, on what was called a, uh, a dream fellowship. And I looked, uh, I was very interested in, in winemaking and in uh, um, dining experiences. So I spent quite a bit of time looking at the creativity that goes on um, and enjoyed some of the best wines in the world, I think, that come from there. So uh, we did have a few cheeky ones there. Nice, thank you very much, Theo. So um, today I'm going to be uh, talking about um, how the you know, proliferation in, in new technologies, uh, what we can do with those, and in particular, how can they change what we see? And when I say see, I mean that loosely. I mean, it's what, how we perceive, how we think. So it's meant as a, a very generic term. So um, let me just see if my slides work. Yes. So I'm going to start off by uh, thinking about how um, uh, uh, old-fashioned prosthetic devices that were specifically um, designed for um, compensating for particular disabilities and the design of those used to be very old fashioned, if you like, or utilitarian. There wasn't much thought given into the aesthetic or how they might look. But over the years, that's changed uh, quite considerably. And what we see is, you know, from the early Braille readers for blind, uh, that they, uh, Apple thought very much about accessibility and how they could design their smartphones so that it wasn't just uh, for sighted people, but for for blind people and suddenly their lives were transformed and, and empowered because they were given a device just like everyone else and it enabled them through uh, uh, text to speech readers and other types of apps to access the internet and do all of the things that you know uh, the rest or all of us can do and I think this was a very uh, significant uh, paradigm change and, and the same with the uh, um, if you look at this uh, prosthetic device, which was uh, designed on the left, it's very um, sort of uh, functional to re replace a limb for someone who'd lost a leg. And if you look uh, to the right, um, you can see uh, the blade that was designed. Um, and not only is it very uh, yeah, cool looking, but it also empowered uh, runners to be able to run faster than those without them. So I think uh, it, this approach to thinking about how you can um, design to empower is a very you know, important one to think about um, technology in general. Um, so uh, just to recap, I think for in prosthetic design, we've seen how it, it not only changes for what people can do, but also uh, how it looks and feels. So you see now that rather than trying to design um, uh, real legs, uh, to design something that looks like a real leg, there have been companies that are starting to design um, uh, fashion designers to create new limbs. And they're very much aesthetic pieces of work. And they, uh, they provide, if you like, a personalized uh, form of, of look, at, you know, look at this wonderful uh, um, um, leggings, if you like, and a powerful statement about uh, 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 that person. So very much a different way of thinking about how to augment someone. And I think we can think about that with the uh, other types of uh, um, augmenting technologies. This is an uh, exoskeleton. I don't know if you've seen these, but they've been around in uh, manufacturing for some time now. And the idea is that you, it's a kind of harness that takes the strain. Um, and it's very functional. Uh, this here is uh, yeah, um, an operator who's moving a very heavy piece of equipment, but is, is being supported. And we can think again about how we might design these to be not just uh, serving a function, but also can be uh, uh, aesthetic or even fun. So here, uh, this is um, a pair of stylish leggings that have been designed uh, with a view to helping people um, to stand up, uh, to lift objects and walk. So they are functional, but also they've been very um, uh, 
uh, you know, some, a lot of thought has gone into how fashionable they look and, and how striking. And what they are is that they're made, there are some artificial muscles that are in, in parts of the leggings uh, made of bubbles that can uh, uh, extend and contract. And there are straps there that can tighten automatically. And so what they do is they, they push and force uh, the legs in particular ways so that they can help with walking. But they can be worn by anyone uh, and to experience new ways of walking. So it's not just those who've had a stroke or, uh, you know, who find it difficult to walk, but it can be, you know, experienced by all. And you can see this here with uh, exoskeletons can be designed to be fun. And these, you know, are um, allowing people to experience uh, what it feels to be taller. And as you can see, they're having a lot of fun there. And I think also you can start to think about super limbs. Uh, how can we design uh, to, um, these types of devices or wearables to enable people to, you know, Ex, you know, change how it feels to feel something. So this is a project that was done with James Young called the Alternative Limb Project. And a 3D hand has been printed and it receives signals uh, from electrodes in, in uh, the body harness, which is up here, to perform a variety of gestures. So this person here is able to experience uh, and think about movement of their uh, prosthetic limb um, in quite different ways to former um, prosthetic limbs. And I think what it's done is um, inspired a forward thinking dialogue about the body and how we experience uh, it and how we can extend it. Again, this is done for someone who has lost an arm, but there's no reason why not to think about how we might extend our, um, you know, people with a third arm. Imagine that you were given a, or a third hand. Um, and that you could uh, control it through muscles in um, in your shoulders or, or or in your back, that would really you know extend what it means to be human. And I think it's quite interesting to think about those possibilities. So I think I want to say that so there's some lessons learned from uh, recent. Um, changes in, in some prosthetic design, which is that it's very important to think about how it's going to be worn. And so fashion is important. Also, it's, you know, making it fun to use um, rather than it just always being utilitarian. And I think uh, of recent, we've seen how it's possible to design um, what I'm calling superhuman powers, where the, the technology uh, can enable us to do more than uh, just by ourselves. So it can make us um, run faster, walk faster, it can make us appear or feel taller and see more. And so more generically, I'm calling this super tech. It, I think it's broadened the accessibility agenda from one that used to be compensatory to one that's about empowering. And I think this is really important. How do we empower people? So the question I want to ask is, how can we design um, super tech? Um, and they're calling it this because it's about the superpowers that are made possible to enable all of us to see more and see meaning um, a range of things, including uh, making decisions, thinking what we attend to, how we perceive um, and so on. And this is a big question, but I think the technology is, you know, that's coming and what we have available is making it um, possible for us to do that. So there are many technologies uh, around um, and uh, in the last few years we've seen augmented reality uh, through spectacles and heads up displays, similarly virtual reality uh, that it's become more affordable and accessible. There are ranges of wearables, uh, um, we've seen some of those but also we've seen advances made in speech interfaces in robotics and chatbots Artificial intelligence and in particular machine learning has uh, entered the fray in terms of uh, being uh, designed with these types of technologies to enhance. We're seeing multi-sensory interfaces appearing that uh, provide haptics as well as visual and auditory feedback. And also uh, we've had tangible and physical computing. So very much thinking about the physical interface as much as the digital. So there's a lot there for us to choose from by, by way of thinking about how we can you know, design and, and extend and empower. But I think we need to think first what it is that we actually want to augment in humans or uh, in ourselves. Is it to enable us to uh, 
perceive uh, the world differently and to see more, like having a sixth sense? Is it to be able to act uh, appropriately and smartly on information in the moment uh, for whatever activity we're doing? So we have just what we need. And it comes to you know whether it's uh, um, you know, talking to someone or uh, controlling a machine, it might provide information that we need just there and then. And equally, uh, is it to enable us to make uh, more intelligent decisions, decisions and measured ones, ones that aren't biased? In, or is it to make us more creative or more aware of each other and the world? It could be all of these, but I think, uh, you know, when we start to think about these uh, human behaviours and, and uh, activities, we can think about which of those technologies might be uh, more appropriate. Once we've thought about a, a type of technology, you then need to think about how we design the interface. And given this is a UX conference, you should know all about well, you know, how to ask these questions. So what kinds of interactions is it, you know, if it's speech, what type of dialogue, who should uh, uh, initiate the dialogue? Uh, how, if it's a gra graphical interface, if it's an augmented, how should it augment the real world and so on? And how does the user interact? So these are core questions that are, if you like, our bread and butter. Um, and then to think again, what kind of digital content and where and when to provide it. And I think it varies depending on the type of technology as to how much and where um, and, and how to control it. And so what should the user do? Uh, should they just be passive or are they active? Do they interact with it? And then to think about how do we evaluate what we're designing for these super technologies? Uh, is it really extending what humans can do and see? And if so, how? Is it making their lives easier? Which is you know, very much uh, behind UX and um, usability. Or is it uh, trying to increase our reach and what we can do and enable us to do more? So I think these are all important questions when we start to think about designing these technologies. So let's start by thinking about all the advances that have been made in wearables. This uh, infographic here shows just the, uh, the range of possibilities. So we've talked about exoskeletons um, and you know, smart pants, if you like. Um, and uh, you can see here all of these other things that are around from what you wear, smart watches, shoes, uh, and belts and so on. So there's a whole number of, of uh, technologies that we might want to explore and think about what you can do. So I guess there are three things that you can do with these types of wearables. One is to record what the body's doing or what's happening around in the environment um, and to monitor uh, and analyze what's going on. Um, and this could be bodily functions or it could be, uh, you know, what's in the environment. It could be pollution levels, CO2 levels. There are all sorts of things. It can then alert and notify us uh, if a particular threshold has been met and uh, suggest what we might want to do. Um, and it can provide contextual information. And typically this has been weather or uh, traffic or something that it, we need to know in the moment as to whether we should change our minds or continue with what we had planned. And so I think uh, there is a real a rich diversity of, of ways of, of, um, by which we might um, in the future design these types of wearables. Um, it's been, I would say wearables have been around for a long time, but the first commercial uh, wearable that came out with much, in much fanfare was Google Glass, which is nearly 10 years ago now. Um, and I don't remember if, if any of you are young enough or old enough or uh, were around um, to try these glasses. Um, and uh, everyone was really excited, but they were very expensive. But essentially what they allowed you to do was to, if you look up here, this was the, the magic here, which was uh, the camera and there was a microphone. And here's uh, this bit here is where you could touch it to control uh, what was being recorded. And also here, this is the bit which is a, a glass and onto that was projected images. And so th that could provide in the moment uh, contextual information. So pretty cool, um, and this is what uh, you might see as you're cycling along or walking along. If you look up when wearing a glass, it could give you uh, directions. Uh, so 
telling you how to get somewhere. So quite small uh, uh, view and quite limited augmenta augmentation. But at the time, it was considered to be quite revolutionary. But because it was um, so new, people were a little uh, uh, um, concerned about what was being recorded. And also, they they, did, they didn't feel comfortable when standing in front of someone wearing um, this glass. And you can see why, is that if you are having a conversation with someone who's fiddling with their glass, uh, the frame of the glass, whilst looking slightly up at the, at the uh, display, you see more of the whites of their eyes, but also it just looks, it just looks weird. And people uh, just didn't want to be uh, recorded in this way. <clears throat> So uh, they started to be banned, people wearing them in, in public places. And then uh, there was lots written about uh, you know, privacy issues and you know, is this the, the way forward? So um, whilst I think it was uh, in, you know, innovative at its time, it did cause a, a tremendous stir and uh, lots of people were quite upset about how it was invading privacy. So at the time, what happened was that uh, it didn't really get off the ground. Um, and so Google Glass was just uh, used in very specialized uh, application areas. But it's the idea that you could somehow augment or extend what people could see in the moment, I think is very much uh, a, a, an innovation of its time. Since then, we've seen Snap um, and Facebook and other uh, um, companies trying to uh, design wearables, uh, uh, in particular glasses, that people might actually want to wear and others aren't uh, wary or frightened of. And perhaps the uh, one that's uh, just come out this year is Snap. I don't know if you've seen them, but on the right they're called Spectacles. Um, and they're a bit clunky, but I think uh, young people quite like wearing you know, these sorts of dark, uh, clunky glasses. But again, there's a camera and a microphone that can record, but perhaps more significantly is what the, you know, what you can see on the screen, which is um, overlaying uh, the real world. And it has a bigger uh, depth of view. And what they've tried to do is to design it such that you can have fun and create uh, uh, colorful content that can overlay what you're seeing. And I think this is quite a big departure from Google Glass, which was very much about providing directions or sending you your emails. And here's a video that uh, they're using to promote these spectacles. As an artist, I'm constantly thinking about the different ways that I can tell stories and share my vision of the world to people. I first saw them and I was like, how does all this technology fit into something so small? The new spectacles are going to allow you to overlay anything you want onto the real world. I like using technology to delight people and immerse them in a world that they couldn't experience in reality. Because I really wanted to use AR in a therapeutic sense. Looking at the ebb and flow of water and sea creatures, I think that really inspires my creation. As a black artist, I feel like a lot of young up and coming artists are not represented. I wanted to showcase their work in an augmented reality gallery in 3D and show them in a light that is beautiful and just inspirational. Now I can actually walk around and see what I'm capturing and get cool shots to share with my friends. I feel like this generation is going to finally push the new digital frontier. This is going to change the game forever. So I loved New Mexico and I really wanted to sort of create a love poem to New Mexico and an immersive history lesson. You are standing on the rim of the Valle Caldera. I love these historic road signs. They're sort of these funny, archaic things. And I love the idea that it might bring new life to this old way that we used to give people information. I think AR is about having a conversation with the world. I always go back to try to ask really essential questions. What makes us human? What makes us happy? What does it mean to be alive and communicating? I love poetry. I love language. I love words. What would it feel like to walk through a poem? Land Studio is this. 
I think uh, we'll stop that there. It goes on for a while. But what is it like to walk through a poem? I thought it was quite profound. Um, but you saw there many creative applications uh, that were being developed by artists, not by computer scientists or designers necessarily. And so this tool suddenly uh, opens up new possibilities for them to be creative. And you could see also in schools uh, how uh, that could be uh, the case. And the, and the thing about the spectacles is that they're lightweight and they're fashionable um, and they don't scare people in the way in which Google Glass did. So this goes back to my earlier point about it's really important when designing these hardware devices to make them uh, you know, ac um, accessible but also uh, cool looking. Um, and also the developer kit, I think, uh, with Spectacle um, allows, um, you know, uh, people to get started straight away in, in creating content. Um, and again, this year, as I said, it's not, uh, Facebook and Ray-Ban have come together to design these Wayfarers. So they don't even look like uh, geeky glasses. You can just about see the camera there and the microphone um, and the control up there, but they're so cool looking. And at the moment they are focusing on uh, um, on the sort of collecting the content or recording but um, I'm sure in the next few months we'll see similar developments as to snap spectacles in terms of augmented reality so I think the world of, of uh, augmented reality through these glass these types of glasses and spectacles is really opening up and it, it's interesting to think in the next year or two how do we use these um, to be creative so that's glasses. Let's think about uh, something more uh, uh, every day, which is the smartphone that we all, most of us have now. Um, and there have been lots of uh, apps developed where AI has been added. And this allows the uh, camera, when you take a photo, to uh, classify the image and, and to match it up with uh, whatever's in, in the data set, and then to be able to provide in the moment contextual information. So in this app, uh, which is a Google app called Google Lens, you can take a picture of your friend's dog. And if you're like me, I don't know much about dogs. I'm not really a dog lover. But if I was to do that, I could say, oh, this is a Labradoodle. Um, or it's perhaps it's a Ladrapoodle. And is it, did, did you know it's created by crossing a, a Labrador retriever and a poodle? So I can pretend to be much more knowledgeable than I am and, and I can impress my friends accordingly. It could also help those with memory problems, uh, people who find it difficult to remember the names of things, or it could help you to identify trees, it could help in education. So I think there's a lot of scope here for thinking about how you provide information to what uh, you take a photo of with your phone. Um, and um, there is also a, a lot of research that's going on at the moment to think about holograms. And a company that we worked with called Hollow Me a couple of years ago developed this uh, app, uh, which is you can um, transport yourself um, into uh, someone else's living room. So if we'd have had enough time, I could have tried to develop an app of myself and transported myself into uh, the, your conference. But given that everyone is online, it probably doesn't make sense to do that. But the idea here is why would you want to do that is that they you know by having the whole body of someone appear in your living room or wherever you are it looks as if they might actually be there and have a more immersive experience and so uh, at the moment it's only one way so it's like a rec pre-recorded but this person could you know give a like a, a two three minute or even longer uh, lecture and you, it's or you know just just come and talk to you and it could all you know almost feel as if they're there so since these early days um the company um uh has uh, de developed the app and it's called a uh, beam and the idea here is that not just your living room but you, whilst you're walking uh, about town um you could um, see your fitness instructor and they could try and motivate you um, and, and it might feel as if they're there. You could even have your banker appear in your study to help you with your accounts. 
um, or you can have your mentor or your collaborator uh, come along with you whilst you're walking. So I think some quite interesting developments as to how you can make people appear more there to make them more immersive uh, whilst you're you know, going about your everyday uh, activities. So this is a company in, in London um, and in the States, there's also been uh, some interesting events. This one is called Portal and I'm going to let the video show how this uh, uh, immersive hologram works. With the whole of glamorous LA to choose from, put me in a box, in a warehouse. Although it is the coolest box I've been in for a while because, spoiler alert, I'm not ready in the box. I'm out here. And that's virtual me. And it's called Portal. The box itself is real, of course, and the lights inside it provide the illumination for the modified human-sized 4K LCD screen on the front. This can show pre-recorded video or live images of some loon messing about in front of the camera. What am I doing over there, though? What, what's he doing? The same? Oh, yeah, of course. And I have to say, I am impressed. I figured out all these reasons why somebody might not want to do a hologram, and I've eliminated all those reasons. So that's why we developed this. And David's right. While I've certainly had some fun with so-called holograms over the years, they've all needed huge setups with precisely placed projectors, enormous pieces of semi-reflective glass or giant meshes, and pretty dark environments to allow the images to stand out. This one, though, is compact, portable and really bright. First things first, these are not holograms. You know what I think about the term hologram, but these are the most realistic not holograms I think I've ever seen. The key is that this bit of the screen is transparent. So if the camera moves to the left and the right, you can see the backgrounds move behind the character. And it really gives you that feeling that they really are there, that this is a 3D image. The small piece of reflective floor and the shadow of the performer are also captured and sent to the booth, something that really adds to the realism. Yeah, it's a thumbs up from me, really. <laughs> He's not too happy, though. So you can see here how they've added shadows and, and really thought about how uh, to make, you know, take this hologram idea one step further. And, and this reporter, who's a tech reporter, who's quite skeptical, was bowled over and mightily impressed. So the idea is that, you know, you could put one of these into um, a library or a, a particular building uh, because they're affordable soon and portable and um, allow uh, characters to appear as if they're there. And so I think that's quite magical and also quite convincing. Um, so it'd be good to see how this type of technology advances because that really is uh, sending us into hyperspace. With the hope. So I'm going to move on now to think about another technology, which is chatbots and AI. We've all seen these chatbots. Some of you might be involved in designing them. They're becoming incredibly successful. Uh, as a way of doing Q&A for companies, for banks, uh, and triaging all of the many queries that their customers have, um, and also in retail. And I think they've been developed to um, manage that type of limited conversation quite, quite um, um, impressively. But I think also what you're seeing in the, in the last two years is um, uh, research that's trying to think about how else and what else can chatbots do and in my own research I've been looking at how we might enhance uh, meetings as you know um, when you go back to face-to-face -face meetings sometimes they can go on forever and sometimes things never get decided and and Sometimes uh, we can't find the right information and they, you know, it's like, well, perhaps we could think about how we might use uh, AI to try and steer those meetings a bit more effectively and try and even enhance our collaborations. And so our research has been to think about, well, how is that possible? Yeah, how, how can we um, try and design these agents to be smart? And if you look at what's currently out there and by way of uh, smart speakers and chatbots, uh, they have already been developed uh, for use um, in business, but primarily as assistants that 
do the scheduling and, and take notes. They're not really doing what I suggested, which is mediating uh, the decision making, the problem solving um, and the collaboration. And um, that's a smart speaker. I wonder why that red thing showed up. Anyway, so um, what we're interested in is can they do more to facilitate um, and, and um, mediate um, those um, conversations during meetings? So the project I've been working on uh, is uh, with Leon um, Reichert, myself and uh, a few others, is that it's called the Voice of His Project. And we designed a collaborative agent called Visi, and the idea was that Visi could help teams uh, when working on fairly open-ended tasks. For example, if you've got piles of data that's come in and you're trying to analyze uh, when you know, the next uh, wave in the pandemic is to appear or what the uh, impact is is of the vaccination programs is quite open-ended there aren't you know uh, obvious ways in which to analyze the data so what we wanted to do was to provide an agent that could help um, facilitate uh, sense making and also to encourage different group members to uh, take uh, partake in more discussion so it's not just one person dominating um, and also to encourage more ideation and divergent thinking, all the things that we'd love to do in meetings, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. And um, because we're from a UX background, we are also interested in uh, how to design the interface. Does it matter whether you have a speech interface or a chat or a text uh, based, i.e. chatbot interface? So we were interested in whether voice versus a screen based interface would make a difference when interacting with this agent. And so this is what it looked like. Uh, we have like um, a shared display where visualizations would appear and the team would ask our agent Vizzy to show uh, different trends or different uh, features or parameters. In this case, it's obesity levels. And we were interested in what, you know, what was causing uh, different trends over the last 30, 40 years. And so they could ask Vizzy, uh, talking to the smart speaker, to say, show us the data for whatever variables, in this case it's women and girls, uh, from year 1900 to, no, 1990 to 2012. I don't think they had records back in 1900. Um, and then they could see why, you know, there was a steep incline or whatever. And in this case, Fizzy was there to uh, primarily um, answer to their, uh, bring up the, the visualizations, but also to prompt them. So um, we ran a study to compare whether talking to Fizzy versus um, just selecting from the interface uh, via a graphical interface would make a difference. So in this case, you in the voice condition, the users or the team would uh, speak out uh, to generate those visualizations. So as I showed, it said, show uh, women and men or show uh, the different uh, variables you're interested in. But also, uh, Vizzy could uh, speak as well. So Vizzy might, if Vizzy thinks that they're struggling, might say, uh, ask a question of them, which is, why is the difference between women and men larger for this particular period of time? So that's the voice condition. For the uh, screen-based or text-based condition, they didn't speak to Vizzy and Vizzy didn't speak to them, but what they did was they selected uh, from uh, this tablet here, possible commands. Uh, so they could select and filter the, the type of query they wanted, and that would result in Vizzy generating the, the same visualization. But then Vizzy would, uh, um, uh, if Vizzy thought they were stuck, would come up in a chatbot here using text, at the same type of uh, question that was asked uh, verbally. So does this make a difference? And how useful was Vizzy in this type of context? Um, let me just hang on a minute. So uh, what we did was we ran a study. We had uh, two conditions, one voice, one screen, and uh, pairs working in, uh, I think it was about 12 pairs in each. And um, they were asked to uh, um, open-ended to think about what were the causes and, and trends in obesity and what might be uh, triggering those. And uh, what we, um, found that there were differences, as you would expect, between different uh, interfaces that in the voice, when they spoke to Vizzy, when Vizzy spoke to them, that they spent more time looking at more of the visualizations. So they, they explored more data 
and were more systematic in doing that. And as a consequence, they had more in-depth discussions and they were able to identify trends more. So voice seemed to uh, facilitate uh, more exploration of the data and also more ideas. They bounced more ideas and, and they thought aloud. In the screen condition where uh, they were largely reading and, and, and selecting, the discussion was less rapid and less spontaneous. And also when they were reading what Vizzy wrote on the screen, that slowed them down and changed the, the train of thought. So I think in, when you're, uh, you know, have teams working together, having voice can really you know, make the conversation flow more and, and, and scaffold it in particular ways. Whereas with, in the, if it just appears on the screen, you have to wait for everyone to read it and this can slow down the conversation. So uh, just to summarize, uh, that was one of the studies we've done. We, we're doing a number of other studies now looking at uh, different contexts and um, uh, how they can facilitate um, decision making. Um, but um, I think what we can draw conclusions from this study is that we can design AI systems that facilitate teams working together, particularly in meetings and especially for open-ended types of tasks where it, having a, this type of agent can trigger uh, more ideas and exploration of the data, particularly when you're using software tools with a, where the um, agent has been embedded. And this can lead to better understanding and decision making um, in teams. And what we showed was that the type of interface, whether it's speech or whether it's text, can uh, steer or scaffold the, the type of conversations that take place. And the voice is more seamless in this context uh, because it's better aligned with the way in which, you know, what happens in meetings, which is we talk to each other uh, and it seems to somehow flow better. Um, uh, whereas the screen, having to read the screen and check that the other people have read the screen, what's happening, can slow it down. And this might be good uh, in certain contexts, but we need to develop new social norms for it to be um, effective. So whilst chatbots are very effective for single users, when you're just looking um, at yourself for information and asking questions, it's um, not yet uh, something that we do quite easily um, as teams or working together. So I want to step back a bit and think about some of the examples I've, I've shown you today, uh, which I'm calling super tech. And I think they can, they're starting to be designed to enable us to do and see more and to extend how we think um, by these three things. Firstly, uh, what I'm calling offloading is that using augmented reality, um, it can overlay the environment with digital annotations just in the moment that can uh, enable us to see the world differently. As we've seen with the AI and agents, uh, it can scaffold uh, our world. So um, they can question and prompt us at opportune times, and this can trigger uh, ideation and different ways of thinking or decision making. And it can mediate uh, what we're doing, helping us to perceive what each other is thinking and to be more reflective. And that one is, you know, think, you know perhaps with the Google Glass and, and follow on types of augmented reality spectacles, help us to, uh, you know, change the way in which we're thinking about others. But as you probably have seen some of the uh, uh, YouTube videos, we can quickly overpopulate our physical world with too much digital uh, content that we get bombarded and it can overload us. Um, any of you who you know, have been to Times Square or Piccadilly Circus will already get that sense of being overloaded with adver adverts that appear on very large billboards. But if you're wearing these types of spectacles, it could appear at any point. So this is something that we have to be mindful of is, is not to pollute our, our digital worlds with too much content that people just stop wearing them. And this is uh, the last part of my talk. I just want to um, say, well, how do we think about how best to design uh, augmented reality and digital content? And I think uh, many years ago, I developed uh, with my colleague, uh, the late Mike Scaife, um, a theory of external cognition. And this is um, uh, an idea where we're thinking about how we can come up with design principles to help us uh, think about the interactions that take place between 
uh, what happens in our head, the internal representations we use, and what happens in the external world when performing our cognitive tasks. And um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to uh, skim over some of the key um, points about this idea or this approach to thinking about design, which is that we can project digital representations through augmented reality onto and into the environment. The key is to think what and how does that aid our thinking? How does it align um, uh, with what we're thinking? How does it extend? Um, and what it can do is it can reduce the amount of cognitive effort required uh, to solve a particular problem in the way in which calculators help us to, to, to do maths uh, problems and calculations where we don't have to use so much cognitive effort. It reduces that and that frees up or allows us to think um, about um, other aspects of the problem in the moment. It can also we uh, put structures um, into the environment that can help us um, to think about the problems differently by scaffolding the environment. And examples are in providing what I'm calling entry points. So uh, I don't know how many of you have ever left a book open or put some put your keys by the door as a, as a reminder for you to do finish off a task or to, to do something on a task. And so providing digital entry points, I think, is interesting um, way of, of dealing with multitasking, but also uh, helping us to uh, combine different types of information together. And I think, again, it will allow us to explore more options and enable us to re reflect and, and reason. So thinking a bit about what the tasks are, which is what I said at the beginning, and where you might put these uh, um, entry points um, into uh, solving problems, I think, is key. So um, just to sort of follow on from that is that we've come up with a number of design principles. There's just two here, but we have a number of other ones. Uh, by which to think where do you put that information in the environment so one is what we're calling cognitive tracing where uh, making marks uh, on different representations to facilitate uh, thinking so here this one is just a a post-it note that's been when you pass your phone next to your keys or your cup of coffee it, it will pop up as a digital reminder saying pick up presents it's a very simple example there of, of placing um, a note in in a place that will trigger what you need to remember the second one is uh, showing um, uh, in a bowling alley where you might try and uh, you know, put your ball to get all of those skittles down and this is what we're calling uh, yeah, temporal and spatial constraining. So we want to make key aspects of the task more salient, distributed over time and space. So you need to think about how do you how do you do that over time and space to affect it. So again, this is a simple example just to show that with a simple line you can you know help someone um, do this type of um, activity. Oops, sorry, what happened there? So I want to just um, conclude. Uh, I hope I've given you a flavour of all the different ways in which we can empower humans to uh, with the, the super technology and importantly for people to wear it and to it to be accepted by others. It needs to be not just functional, uh, but it also needs to be fashionable and it needs to be fun. Uh, in many contexts and it needs to fit in. People aren't going to wear uh, many of these unless they feel comfortable in them. I've just given you uh, some uh, examples of the design principles that we developed uh, as this idea of external cognition to inform the design of augmented reality. And most importantly, we shouldn't overload uh, with um, digital content, but we need to think about uh, you know, using um, augmented reality sparingly to, to offload it into the environment so that it can enhance um, and steer what we do. So um, seeing as it's, I've got a few more minutes, I'm just going to finish so that leave you thinking about what's happening in the future. And the future, as you know, and it's been in the news in the last few weeks uh, with uh, Facebook uh, and also uh, Microsoft have been talking about the metaverse. And the metaverse, uh, if you haven't been following the news, is this idea that it's a virtual world immersive where people will interact as avatars all the time they will be sitting there just uh you know moving around in these in these virtual worlds rather than in the physical world 
And my question is, is this extending or is this uh, reducing the way in which we interact? Is it the right way forward? So rather than uh, give you Mark Zuckerberg's um, uh, vision of the future, I'm going to give you Microsoft's uh, and then I'm going to finish on that to get you to uh, think about that. Metaverse. You've probably started to hear this word being thrown around lately. If you're lost, you're in the right place. Here, we'll try to answer some big questions from Microsoft's point of view. What is a metaverse? Does it already exist? And are you already in it? Let's dig in. Simply put, a metaverse is a digital space inhabited by digital representations of people, places, and things. Think of it like a new version, or maybe a new vision, of the internet. Many people talk about the internet as a place. Now we can actually go into that place to communicate, share, and work with others. It's an internet that you can actually interact with, like we do in the physical world. And it's not just a vision anymore. Right now, you can go to a concert and experience a show with other real people inside a video game. You can walk a factory floor from your own home. You can join a meeting remotely, but be in the room to collaborate with your coworkers. Those are metaverses, and the future is already here. Now, I can already hear some skepticism, but an avatar of me isn't me. My digital self is not my physical self. Well, that is technically true, but Microsoft is working to help you better represent your whole self in the digital space, while also ensuring that you can bring your humanity and your agency over that representation with you. If the past few years have taught us anything, it's that we need that flexibility. The world has never been more connected, but lately we've often needed to distance ourselves physically. The closer we can reflect our physical selves in the digital realm, the more these barriers we can break down. Teammates can join meetings from anywhere. Real-time translation allows people from diverse cultures to collaborate in real time. This is what takes this from a cool idea to a critical one. The metaverse has the ability to stretch us beyond the barriers and limitations of the physical world. So I think I will leave it at that and uh, say thank you very much. And if there are any questions. Uh, thank you so much for that awesome talk, uh, Yvonne. Thank you for, I mean, that was so much insight and knowledge. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we've got three questions already. Um, so let me read that out. Uh, the first question by Anna. How do you imagine super tech will enable education in the future? Um, I think there's many uh, opportunities for using super tech in education. Um, one of my first uh, uh, areas of research was looking at uh, super tech at the time, which is the Internet of Things and uh, mobile technologies. Uh, where we put technology into a woodland and allow children to explore and see things they couldn't before. And they were so excited by having these sensor devices that could detect uh, how much light. Uh, this is before uh, mobile phones. And it was the first time that uh, they had used this technology, which wasn't just a, a, a PC or a laptop um, on, on the, you know, in the classroom they went out and used all of these devices that we had created and uh they were just so curious so excited and i think we can do the same now with the the new super tech we can design wearables to get people to feel what it uh, feels like uh to not be able to breathe or to breathe deeply or to explore the environment to measure things I think the, the possibility is endless and it's about it's down to the educational designers uh, creativity and the affordability of the technology uh, to come up with these things. So um, very much the, the future is um, is bright in that in that regard. Um, and uh, I also think that the technology is more affordable. When we developed uh, the ambient wood, I, I needed about 20 uh, engineers and computer scientists and designers. Now I think a, a PhD student could 
uh, very much come up with something um, using you know smart technology in fact this uh, this um, autumn or should I say your spring we are part of the snap creativity challenge and what snap does is each year they've run it for two years you might be interested in looking at this they invite uh, schools from all over the world to take part in their challenge and they give a brief and the brief is to think about how you can design fun co-located social experiences to get people to connect and so along with uh another university in um india in uh, australia and uh the us uh my students are connecting with their students and they've been given the um uh, the, the spectacles to try and come up with with new experiences. So they're learning how to um, prototype um, and use these spectacles in quite different contexts. So I really think it's possible um, to um, use SuperTech and design SuperTech in a variety of educational contexts. Thank you. Um, I hope that answers the question, Anna. So the next one, it's a bit of a long one, so I'll read slowly. What is your opinion on external cognition that might inhibit oh, something more there, that might inhibit our own brain process and thinking? Will it not in the long run make us lazy to think and remember certain things? The same way a calculator helps us, but also inhibits us to remember and, and work out basic calculations on our own searching for basic questions on Google because it is easier than thinking and remembering almost offloading our thoughts onto technology instead of building better cogn cognition of ourselves? I think that's a really good question. It's one I wrestle with and it keeps me awake at night um, sometimes. It's that, you know, we can uh, design uh, these new technologies to take on more and more of, of what we do. And you see that happening in various activities like trading uh, and um, where, and also in, in you know, manufacturing where we you know essentially offload a lot of the uh, computation or the cognitive tasks onto the machinery and we you know become much more passive you see that in driving uh, where we will have driverless cars where essentially we do much less and i think there is a real danger uh, that uh, we do become lazy uh, and uh, our brains do um, in the future, we do less. But I think there's something about the, the brain that is always, you know, it, there's something about it being curious. So uh, when the Google search came along, it, it, it encouraged us to ask lots of questions that we might not have otherwise. And so many people suddenly had access to all sorts of knowledge that they might not have. They might have had some encyclopedias, but um, but not necessarily the means and ways of, of asking questions. So what it the, what it's done is it's encouraged us to develop the skill from a very young age, from three or four years old, to ask questions, whether it's asking uh, Alexa or Siri and being creative in how we ask those. So I think on the one hand, it could uh, make us lazy, but on the other, what we're seeing is it's actually making us more curious. The technology, if it's designed in a way, we can see new opportunities. So, you know, if you think about, um, uh, I'm not sure this is a good thing, but if you are worried about uh, your you know, health, you might spend hours and hours reading up all what's possible and become much more knowledgeable rather than just going to an AI uh, agent and asking it uh, to say, uh, you know, to tell you what, what's wrong with you um, or, a, or a, you know, a doctor. So I think it, it can, but I also think we are in, innately or inherently cu uh, curious. And if we're given the tools, we can uh, hone our, um, you know, questioning skills more. Thank you. Um, so our next question uh, it's by Kelly. With the metaverse and similar, is accessibility being taken into account? One of my biggest concerns is whether blind or visually impaired users would be excluded. Again, a really a good question. People at Microsoft have been looking at HoloLens 2 and developing uh, an audio version for blind people. So Cecily Morrison at uh, uh, Microsoft Research Cambridge has developed a really impressive uh, multi-sensory, or sorry, sensory substitution device so that 
that you don't see but you hear so um a her child who's blind um has uh, a trial the this new uh, adaptation of hololens so that uh the child can hear who's in the room and it's and the audio is sort of stereo or it's all round so that they can actually have a an audio mental model of who's in the room and and that gets refreshed and they might say so and so has moved and then so and so might say something over there so they are thinking about how to develop new ways of extending uh blind people's ability to know in the moment who is in the room and what they're doing by having this kind of uh, audio uh playing um, okay. yeah so yes i think it, the particularly microsoft are very aware about how we should be taking accessibility into account and i think that you know some of these technologies do do allow that thank you so much um, that was quite a popular question. Uh, the next one is from Yoke. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. What are your thoughts on privacy and ethical concerns being addressed with ubiquitous computing? Again, that's a, a question of the moment. Everyone is worried uh, um, about where the data goes, where it's stored um, and what's done with it. And I think, uh, you know, this is a, a matter for legislation and policymakers to to, to uh, think about how they, you know, um, monitor and, and uh, you know, uh, keep an eye on, on what's happening there. I think we can also think about different uh, technologies uh, for storing data, not necessarily in the cloud, but on the device or on the edge. Um, and so um, what's really important is that we try and follow some of these principles that are coming out, you know, about transparency, about fairness. Um, but also we provide explanations to the general public to reassure them that their data is being used in, in um, you know, safe ways. And so I think people were really, when uh, the smart speakers like Alexa came, people were really scared about that it was recording everything they were saying. And it, it took quite a, you know, some time to try and explain how it works. And I think that's the same with other ubiquitous technologies that people are fearful, fearful because they don't understand because they're not being explained to them properly, um, uh, and they can't find out how they're working, what's happening to their data. And I, I think there are lots of issues that we need to uh, research at the moment as we get more of these devices, particularly wearables. So, uh, for example, you might. You know, there are many apps that are coming out with AI that um, access personal data, and this could be uh, just your breathing, or it could be your, you know, your heart rate that you're measuring. Where does that go? And um, that might help with med, you know, medical advances, but you might not want them to know that you've got a particular condition. So I think there's no straightforward answer, but we all have to be working on this together um, at different levels, right up to, as I said, the policymakers. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. And the last question, uh, you mentioned you can put a list of design principles. Is this available to everyone? They are. Um, I can send you a link, um, but if you look up um, external cognition Yvonne Rogers in Google search you could probably find some of those earlier papers but it's it, it spurred me on to think perhaps I need to update uh, that research and make it more accessible to um, you know, technologies of today so uh, that's what will be my task thank you I just found the list Yvonne Rogers .com publications so I'll just paste that in the chat as well for everyone um, yeah, uh, that was... can, yeah. If someone wants to email me in particular, I can I can forward on. Uh, but I also do need to update that research to make it more accessible and and relevant to current technology design. But I think it's still very relevant. Thank you, thank you so much for the answers, for the knowledge, for the insights. Um, if there are any questions, please uh, connect with Yvonne. She is on LinkedIn. I uh, just posted the link in the chat. Um, if you do have any more questions, um, as she said, she's more than happy to, to engage. Uh, thank you so much for the awesome talk, Yvonne. That's so uh, I, 
My pleasure, and thank you for all the quite good questions and lots of positive uh, comments. I only wish I could be there in Cape Town uh, with you in person, but maybe, you know, who knows, in a year or two, that might be possible. Uh, but it's one of my favourite places in the world, uh, and I'd love to come back sometime. We love having you here, so <laughs> as, soon as, as soon as we can make a plan, let's do it. Um, okay. So if we can meet in person. And I'm sure Theo would want to would want to have a few cheeky ones with you again as well. Definitely, I'm we looking forward <laughs> to cheeky ones. Probably not this early in the morning, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much um, for your call. So everyone will be moving.